call, but I am Chris Lovica, president of the Tottenary Chamber of Commerce. We're so pleased to provide an opportunity for our members today um, to hear from our legislators in what we uh, know will be a very informative conversation. And I want to thank each of them for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be with us. I want to thank our sponsors, Bluestone Bank, Bristol County Savings Bank, Taunton Federal Credit Union, and Bay Coast Bank. And as we proceed, if you have any follow-up questions to things that are being discussed, please enter them into the chat and we will address them if time permits. So I'm pleased to announce that, again, this legislative update will be hosted by Mary Ellen Frias, the uh, chair, um, executive director of GATRA, and she is also chair of our Government Affairs Council here at the Chamber. So before we introduce our panelists, I'd like to invite Taunton Mayor Shauna O'Connell to say a few words. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. I think it's a great way to start my day with you all uh, early on a Monday morning. So it's great to see everyone. I hope everyone had a lovely Easter. Um, it's a nice weekend for family and uh, kind of getting things done too. Uh, so um, I want to remind everyone that we are having a nonprofit workshop tomorrow here for Taunton nonprofit uh, nonprofits. And that was kind of created and organized by Jay Patikos, our executive director of economic development. We really saw um, you know, a need and a way that we could help out our nonprofits to continue um, in you know, uh, a meaningful way, the services that you provide here for our residents in the city of Taunton. So that is tomorrow uh, beginning at 8 a.m. And mm -hmm. it is at Coyle Cassidy. So we also thank um, BCC for working with us around that. Uh, there's a registration link on our Facebook page and our City of Taunton website, or you can just contact Jay if um, you haven't signed up and you would like to attend. It's gonna be a very informative uh, day and workshop for us. So we think, and we're partnering with the Boys and Girls Club around that as well. So we thank them and Jay uh, for getting this whole thing together for us. Um, you're going to see a lot of really exciting things happening in the city of Taunton this year. Construction season is coming up, so we're going to be doing a lot of road work. So keep that in mind when you are leaving for work every Monday morning, uh, that there's going to be some road work going on. Um, but that's a good thing. We're really improving our streets, improving our infrastructure, and uh, we're also going to be having a lot of ribbon cuttings this coming year as well, um, as we have in the past. Uh, so we really appreciate all the work of our city and town staff, but really our partnerships with you all um, to improve the quality of life here in town and, and uh, really improve our economic outlook. And we can't do it alone. We have uh, many partners on the business side and the nonprofit side uh, that we very much appreciate the work that you do and your partnership with us. Uh, we also very much appreciate our legislative delegation and all of the work that they do. So uh, them taking the time out of their busy days today to be with us, we are very thankful for. And uh, I know we're running a few minutes late, so I will hand it right back over to Chris and wish everyone a wonderful week. Thank you, Mayor O'Connell. Um, Chris, I haven't seen the Senator join, so I'm going to... Not yet. Okay, so I am going to introduce those distinguished guests that are here, and please give a wave as we introduce you. So I'm gonna start with Rep. Carol Doherty. Uh, Carol, uh, Rep. Doherty is the representative of the third Bristol district, Taunton and Easton. Her career and community service have focused primarily on education. She was elected president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, serving two consecutive terms, and was later appointed director of professional development in the School of Education at Northeastern University, where she remained for 18 years. She currently serves on the House Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change, House Committee on Ways and Means, Joint Committee on Bonding, Capital Expenditures and State Assets, and the Joint Committee on Children, Families, and Persons with Disabilities, the Joint Committee on Election Laws, and the Joint Committee on Ways and Means. Darty. Nice job, Mary Ellen. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would have appreciated that. I won't take but a moment to say good morning to everyone who is 
thankfully gotten out of bed for a nine o'clock meeting. Thanks, Chris, for that uh, after a <laughs> holiday. So it is a credit to you and to your organizing skills in order to get all of your folks uh, here this morning. I am looking forward to a robust and interesting conversation. Lots of stuff going on at the legislative level. You probably read all about it on the front page of the paper or listen to the news about what's going on uh, legislatively. So I look forward to particularly listening to the people who are here, who have come to listen to us. I always learn by listening to someone else. So thank you for this. Thank you, Carol. I have the pleasure of introducing Representative Patricia Haddad. Representative Haddad it represents the 5th Bristol District, which includes the communities of Dighton, Somerset, Swansea, and Taunton. A member of the House since 2001, she currently serves as Assistant Vice Chair of the House Committee on Ways and Means. She serves in a variety of other committees, including Human Services and Elderly Affairs, Healthcare, Medicaid, Natural Resources and Agriculture, Rules and Ethics. Representative Haddad served two terms as Chairwoman of the Joint Committee on Education, one term as second assistant majority leader and five terms as speaker pro tem. Good morning, Representative Haddad. Good morning, good morning. I'm looking forward to discussing the challenges that we're facing. So um, I know you are all facing similar challenges. So as Rep. Jarity said, I'm, I'm here to listen and try to be helpful. All right, thank you, Rep. Haddad. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our final uh, representative, Representative Norman Oral who currently holds the 12th Bristol District seat to the Massachusetts House. In his second term, he represents the citizens of Taunton and East Taunton, as well as the surrounding communities of Lakeville, Berkeley, and Middleborough. Throughout his time in office, he has proudly supported a variety of initiatives to sustain and expand the local economy around the Taunton area. Representative Oral is assigned as the ranking minority member for the Joint Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, and ranking minority member on the Joint Committee on Municipalities and Regional Government. Additionally, he um, serves on the Joint Committee of Transportation, Joint Committee on Bonding and Capital Expenditures and Capital Assets. Representative Worrell. Good morning, good morning everybody. I hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. Uh, it was lovely to have finally a, a dry, beautiful spring weekend to enjoy, hopefully with family. And uh, I know I did have grandkids down uh, for unusual occasion, so that was great. Um, this is becoming, uh, we're really entering our last push for the legislative session until the end of July. So there's gonna be a lot of things happening, the budget first and foremost, uh, if not a few things before the budget, but uh, there's a lot coming out, a lot to do. It's hard to keep kind of uh, sight on what's coming and what may happen, but it's important as my colleagues have said for us to hear from you so that we can help guide and do what we can as your delegation to represent what you're looking for in the city of Taunton and surrounding areas. So thank you again and good morning. Thank you. So given that, we will jump right into the questions. And as I ask these questions, we will direct them to a specific person, but other representatives are also welcome to share additional information. And if you have any questions that you wanna submit that come up while we're doing this, you can pop them into the chat. I'm gonna start with Rep Doherty. With the migrant crisis impacting our community, what conversations are happening at the state level to address this? You're on mute, Rep. Thank you very much. You'd think we'd gotten used to that by now. Um, I have to say that uh, the migrant crisis conversation among uh, our colleagues uh, uh, and from the leadership is really at the top of the agenda. It is bumping uh, up against a housing crisis that we're facing. And so uh, the efforts of the legislature to try to find some solution to ease us away from the extraordinary uh, situation that we find ourselves here. I think that the Massachusetts is um, like no other state in the union in terms of its impact. You probably are aware that the governor capped the numbers of families in our emergency assistance shelter system uh, to 7,500, and half of those families are residents of uh, Massachusetts, in our case, uh, theoretically anyway, residents of the city of Taunton. The Senate, both the Senate and the House have deliberated over bills that have come before us. 
the uh, House um, about a month ago and the Senate only last week. Those bills are very similar, but different actually in essence. So the similarities are that both branches have put um, a cap on the length of stay that people can stay in that emergency shelter system to nine months uh, in the house with an extension to 12 months for disabled people, women who are pregnant uh, or other critical uh, situations for them to maintain their housing. Uh, and on the Senate side, the uh, Senate has put a cap of 12 months with an opportunity to extend for 90 days with uh, as long as people who are living in the shelter are meeting the criteria that's set forth by them. I learned in all of this uh, conversation that there is a piece uh, required in each of the shelters that each individual should have a housing plan. When this bill, putting a cap on the length of time, came before us, many of us were very concerned about what will happen if you push people out the door at nine or 12 months, where would they go? They then become the responsibility of our community. Uh, and uh, what what is being articulated, I think, in the Senate legislation is criteria, kind of like a checklist. You have to you have to be actively engaged in trying to find uh, some way out the door for you and your family as a migrant. You have to be actively engaged in either in a training program, which is in the House bill, or in, in an actual job. The conundrum for the actual job and the actual housing is that the work permits are coming very slowly. Uh, so the governor's office is working very hard to try to get work permits so that people can go to work. Uh, there is a training program that's available for those who have a job or don't, but nonetheless, at the end of that, if there is no work permit, then you can't have a job. The second, of course, is housing. Uh, how do we how do we push people out the door if there is no nowhere for them to go? And so we are working uh, to that end. And the biggest piece that's of greatest concern, I think, to many of our residents is that in these supplement and these uh, issues have come forward in a supplemental budget, uh, having to appropriate money to uh, uh, keep resources available to the end of this fiscal year. And in the Senate bill, uh, they are appropriating or suggesting appropriating funds out of our supplemental money that will keep us through, or at least partially through the 2025 year. So it is, uh, right now, both those bills are in a conference committee. Uh, they'll work out those nuances and distinctions and they will come to us. And they need to come to us relatively quickly because the resources are running out to help to support the shelter. So theoretically, putting a cap on the length of stay will save save money. Uh, from In the mind of some, it will deter people from coming. But I think that uh, the bottom line is that the Congress in a broad context, uh, i.e. the United States, needs to act uh, in order to set up some guardrails for the influx of migrants that are coming into the country. Uh, they need to weigh, uh, loosen the uh, pathway to getting a work permit and they need to provide resources to the state uh, in order for us to be able to continue forward if we must do that. Tough situation. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rep. It certainly is a difficult situation with probably no immediate golden bullet answer here. Uh, moving on to another, probably not a very easy situation to address, Rep Haddad. What can you tell us about the Stewart healthcare situation and thoughts on the status of Morton Hospital? And also, how do you think the reopening of the Brockton Hospital will impact our area? Thank you. Um, you're absolutely right. There are no good answers. <clears throat> Healthcare has become increasingly convoluted, increasingly difficult. You have, um, as nothing operates in a vacuum, you have a number of problems. Lack of staff. Uh, lack of ability to move patients along because if they're in uh, in the hospital and they need to go to a different kind of setting, whether it be long-term or, or a mental health setting, those beds are not available. And um, it, it's very difficult to get 
people into the pipeline to become staff. So that being said, now you layer on this really, <laughs> really difficult problem of um, the Stewart system after several years of bad behavior um, and not giving anybody clear answers about their finances or anything that's going on with them, we now find ourselves in a place where um, they're claiming that they can't survive. So on Tuesday, I think uh, many of you might've seen that their answer to this, to get more money into their system is to sell off um, their physician groups to another giant conglomerate, another group that is uh, for profit. And we have serious concerns of whether this uh, reaches the level of being a monopoly. Um, the, the, you know, the issues that we can't touch right now because it's gonna become a three pronged local, state, and federal officials trying to figure out, is this a good idea? Should we be allowing for-profit entities into the state? Um, and, and how do we, there are no teeth right now in you have to report X, Y, Z. If you don't report X, Y, Z, we have no ability to make them, you know? So I think you also know that uh, Senator Markey has been working on this. Um, Part of, the part of my delegation has written a letter both to uh, the attorney general and the, uh, the executive director of the Health Care Policy Commission, stipulating that here are the ways, here are the laws that are being broken and here, here's what you can, what we would hope you would do, um, especially with regard to buying up these docs who will end up having little to no autonomy. They're gonna to be told how long, what. We're, we're very concerned that it will become about quantity and not quality. And in the meantime, in, in my district in particular, I have two steward hospitals who I will have said repeatedly, I will say once again, corporate does not deserve the kind of commitment and the kind of, um, goodwill that is coming from the staff members who are completely disregarding other things so that they can um, deliver quality care. And, and so, you know, we're not in a good place. I, I don't, I don't want to dress it up. We're just not in a good place because we need this to be go back to being um, not for profit. So, you know, I just want, sometimes I just want to scream help because um, it, it's just, there are too many um, too many variables that we cannot control. So I, I know you're feeling insecure. I know my constituents are feeling insecure, but I do want to be able to say to everyone, the attorney general's on it, the um, healthcare finance, which is a, I, I don't wanna go into it because it's a big long, but it is, um, it's a group that we created in order to um, look at policy and, and really try to hold people's feet to the fire, the federal government, and of course, um, the state government. So no good answers and, you know, very, very difficult situation. But I want to, once again, congratulate both Morton and St. Anne's, the people, because the people who are uh, staffing that hospital, because they're doing yeoman's work, trying to make it work. Thank you for that, Rep. Pat Ed, and, and you're right. It's uh, we have to be grateful for the people who do show up for work every day. Um, all right, just so you don't think we're letting him off the hook, we saved uh, one, a topic near and dear to my heart for Rep. Oral. Um, what is the status of South Coast Rail, and when can we take a train from Taunton? Yes, thank you. I, I do want to say first, though, that the, the first two issues really, and even the South Coast Rail. The, these are issues that are affecting all of us. The, the the migrant situation, I'll just throw in the other two cents, which is it's really impacting budgets. It's really, I cannot stress that enough. So, you know, let's think about it. We're using one-time monies right now to fill gaps. That money's not going to be there next year. 
we got major issues to look at in this next year's budget. And as the speakers indicated, well, if we're going to continue at this pace, then where are we going to cut? Because the revenues are not coming in. So the extremely impactful that issue is, so I, you know, kudos to you to bring it up. And also the steward. The steward affects all of us. I know I have doctors in the physicians group that is now looking at being sold. What does that mean? Where do they go? Uh, you know, the whole buildings that they're in, and it's, it's a complete mess. And we're doing our best to stay on top of it, but there's so many moving pieces. So I can uh, rest assure all of you that, and your employees and, and, your, and, and your families, that we're doing our best to cover all these issues. Um, but they are expansive, but we do realize that this is very important to our region, all of those, those two issues. And then South Coast Rail, yes. Um, so the answer, quick answer is it, this fall is when the trains should be running with passengers. Um, construction is mostly done. Uh, I think there were some delays with some, you know, post COVID uh, uh, um, supplies. Also, uh, I had a lot of questions uh, with a, a, a kind of a coexisting project that came with South Coast Rail, which was the interchange and bridge repair at 24 and Route 140. And a lot of people noticed how that was shut down. We were dealing with a Rhode Island contractor, Cardi Corporation, that, that was well underway and then suddenly went bankrupt. And the issues of clearing the books and figuring out legally how to move that work to a new contractor. But finally, in the last few months, you may have noticed work is started by a new contractor who's picked it up, Manafort. They're very capable, uh, very excellent contractors. So they should be able to get that project back on track. Um, however, they will not probably have that finished prior to the opening of South Coast Rail. So it did somewhat delay the South Coast Rail having that, but they're gonna, they figured out a way to move forward with the trains without uh, completing the actual highway work. Because uh, as many of you may realize, there'll be a new ramp, additional amp, ramp uh, exit from uh, southbound 24 to 140. So it'll be right across from the entrance to the train station. Uh, for folks that want to come down from Rainham or, or points north to the train station. So that was a bit of a delay. The other uh, factor is with the increased um, increased interest in safety on our trains. And we've seen the, the Green Line extension, for instance, in, uh, out of Boston was opened and then had to be shut down with various issues. And of course, the federal government's involvement now in overlooking what safety is going on and what the protocols are here at the MBTA in Massachusetts, um, this has added on a bunch of safety, which is, in the end will be a good thing. So this summer really is going to be devoted to running multiple, multiple safety operations, trains, checks, inspections, so that we don't end up in the situation with the green line where things were opened and then tracks were too narrow, et cetera, various issues. So that really has brought the, the highlight um, to the safety aspects, running tests. So that's what the delay, that's the main portion as I understand of what the delay has been for an opening in the fall. But the hope is once it's open, uh, then it'll be up and running. Um, and if there's any other questions on it, I'd be glad to answer, but hopefully that covers it. Well, thank you very much for that. I'm going to go back to Rep. Doherty for any details you can provide us on the House bond bill. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, uh, there is uh, always a bright light on the landscape of the legislative work, apart from the sort of dim cloud over Stewart and the budget and uh, the delay in the train and all of that kind of thing as you all deal with challenges like that. The Affordable Homes Act is H4138. Um, and you might want to jot that down because there are so there's so much detail and so many highlights in there in that uh, uh, affordable housing uh, bond bill that it is it will be difficult to articulate that in the short period of time this morning. But suffice it to say, 
that Governor Healy proposed this $4.1 billion housing bond bill uh, sometime in October. And it is uh, just now making it's perking its way up to the legislature and into the bonding and capital expenditure committee so that we can uh, act on it so that it can go forward to the um, uh, to the legislature for a vote and then over to the Senate, to the House and then over to the Senate. Uh, as you have heard, uh, as particularly when we're talking about the migrant crisis, the migrant crisis and the housing crisis have bumped up against one another. And so it just makes things much more difficult than, uh, than they would under ordinary circumstances. We have an astounding housing shortage with only um, with a shortage of about 200,000 units of housing across the Commonwealth. Here in Taunton, and uh, uh, if uh, Jay Patikos was or is on here, uh, he can talk about the yeoman's effort that our Department of Economic Development is making to construct uh, a new or to renovate existing facilities, particularly around the downtown area to uh, improve the numbers of units that are available. So just walk through downtown and you can see the work, uh, that work in progress. But I think that in the overall, there's no single solution to the challenges that we face, uh, that we face in housing. The only opportunity for real progress is this comprehensive investment and improve, improved utilization of all the resources that are at our disposal. This bill, the Affordable Housing Act, lays out a comprehensive approach to both its proposed funding levels and its policies around housing construction. Um, and just by way of history, if I can take a few moments, the acute housing shortage uh, that we're facing now uh, is been in the making, as I understand it, for some many years with decreased federal and state investment in housing construction and renovation. Uh, that ongoing disinvestment will not be fully addressed with only incremental adjustments. The Affordable Housing Act proposes an ambitious, as I said, 4.1 billion, just think of those zeros, 4.1 billion dollars in capital funding over a five-year period of time with funding distributed over a wide range of resources to support not only affordable housing uh, but mixed income housing development as well uh, so within this region within our own community there's not only a need for more housing that's affordable to low-income families uh, uh, but for housing that is affordable to a broader range of residents and so the governor's proposal supports mixed income housing. It all, it, it, and that, if you hear the term mixed income housing, it goes hand in hand with the same term workforce housing. So that middle income range of people uh, will be able to take advantage once, uh, once going forward. So, um, so that, that's the focus. Uh, housing, as I said, is really a challenge. There are six pages that I have in front of me here of bullet points uh, that I'm sure you don't want me to read uh, that uh, point out all of the aspects of the affordable housing, uh, the affordable housing act that the governor has proposed. Uh, so, and and again, it's a bonding bill, so it really depends on the um, ability, the opportunity for people to take advantage of what is in that bill, so that the uh, the administration can get those bonds in order to provide the resources to the developers and others uh, in order to uh, construct those housing. Um, one of the things or two of the things that are of our particular import is uh, I, I think that our public housing units, and there are some, I don't know, 3,100 public housing units across the Commonwealth, uh, need to be, there needs to be resources to renovate some of these very old facilities. And so there is a big piece in this Affordable Housing Act that is devoted to uh, renovation and improvement and repair to that housing stock, which is very much needed. Uh, and the other is to look at the aging housing stock, generally apart, apart from public housing, uh, where resources are going to be provided to help to improve and renovate our existing uh, older housing stock and um, houses, uh, uh, buildings, apartment buildings that have gone um, without the attention and care that they need. There'll be resources in order for that to in order for that to ha happen. So 
there is a substantial investment in funds over the next five years of doing this. The one thing though, whenever the housing uh, issue comes up, I say, and this is a wonderful uh, opportunity for housing production across the Commonwealth in many ways, is that the calls that I get are from people who are being pushed out of their homes uh, and into uh, homelessness in many instances. And so they call us to ask if we can help them either with eviction problems or finding a different apartment or getting a space in an emergency assistance shelter in order for them to have a roof over their head. And this bill at the moment, and there are many other pieces of legislation that address the issue of homelessness. And I always say, whenever I have an opportunity to Secretary Augustus, this is wonderful, uh, it, much needed, but it doesn't answer my immediate need to respond to someone who calls and says, I have no home. I'm living in the backseat of my car and we know that that exists. And so, and, and that's immediate and emergency housing. Uh, and there just are not enough units to help to support people in that regard. So it takes a long time for a brand new uh, piece of property to be developed from conception to implementation. And it's not, in my opinion, at this point, meeting the need of our homeless population. Oh, I'm not in. Leave the next. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm going to open up this last uh, question to all three uh, representatives, building on what Rep. Doherty was, was discussing. Affordable housing is also an issue that impacts your ability as a community to grow and support your workforce. Right? We're all looking for employees, and this is an ongoing concern. Uh, what can you share with us about efforts uh, with regards to supporting and growing workforce? Well, I'll start since I unmuted myself. Um, again, nothing operates in a vacuum. Um, I think you've all been watching what's happening in Milton with um, a suburb trying not to participate in having some um, affordable housing. Um, I think we're going to see that more and more often. And uh, if any of you live in my suburbs, Please get involved in the process so that uh, we can make sure that there are not uh, zoning is zoning uh, bylaws created that will stop a city or town from having affordable housing. Um, I'll just give you an um, not only are we worried about our over 55s, but we're worried about our young people who can't afford to stay in our communities, who can't afford to get apartments. And, you know, it always used to be a joke about living in your parents' basement. It's not a joke anymore. It is where we have had to um, make sure that our young people stay and have a place to live. So that sort of leads into the question of workforce development. Um, you know, we have... We have BCC on the line here. There are a lot of training programs, um, not just at BCC. Uh, and, and many of these groups try to work very closely with employers to make sure that the uh, skills that are necessary in that particular uh, business are available. And I know BCC does a really, um, a re has a really strong uh, sense that this is what we should be doing. We shouldn't just be training people. We should, for whatever. We need to train people for the jobs that people are looking for. So, um, you know, I, I just think it's it all becomes part of the, the problem with housing. Um, you know, we all see, a, well, not we all, but I saw one of my um, children, who's not a child anymore, go to the Boston area for a job. Um, some people, some are seeing their children go to the Providence area. If we want to keep our businesses um, vibrant, we need to have housing that people can afford. And that includes, you know, the kid that comes out of high school, uh, high school with a trade who can't afford to live other than in their parents' basement. So, um, you know, it's available, but there are 
so many challenges to getting to those trainings. And I'll just put in a plug for um, reconnect. We're, you know, we're retraining a lot of people in our community colleges free of charge. And um, there are, there are a group of people who are very committed to honing their skills or redeveloping skills. So I, I hope that answered some of your question. Thank you for that rep, Pat Ed. I don't know if uh, either rep oral or yeah. Barry want to weigh in. I'll jump in a little bit on that. I, I think, you know, the, it's a, it's a broad, we're, we've all taken a broad look at how to in, increase the, the, the workforce. And, you know, this is where we do see, well, if we, we need to find a way to benefit from the migrant situation, uh, getting work permits to them, getting uh, them out in the workforce. Uh, that's for some jobs that they may be able to do. Um, but we all know there's a variety of jobs we're trying to fill here, a lot of them more technical. It's wonderful that we've uh, all been invested into Bristol Plymouth and increasing uh, the ability there to train up trades uh, with the new school. So we're excited about this region benefiting from a up-to-date school with new technology and just really helping get uh, more of our kids involved. And not only just through the training, but also really kind of a change in thought over the last 10 years of not everyone has to go to college um, to be successful. And we need folks focused on the trades. They're good jobs. And and some of them can even get uh, started towards that further technical, but it's a great way to start. And then it's really feeling, feeling a need that we, that we have. And then I'd move it on to the transportation aspect. One of the benefits of having a network of transportation, and certainly at Gatry, you're aware of this, to get folks to the jobs back and forth. If we have uh, more ease of routes, we're hoping that the South Coast Rail will open up those passageways in a, in a, with a major route. And then we're going to need secondary routes with Gatry and so forth to get people maybe closer from uh, Cotley Junction in East Taunton up to downtown or wherever. Um, but having that ability to move people cheaply, uh, get them off the roads, but get them to the jobs that we have here. And we're hoping that as Massachusetts continues in its growth and uh, the need for affordable housing, um, that, you know, maybe we'll see some more of the higher tech jobs come out to New Bedford, Fall River, or Taunton and really take advantage of what we have out here. And with having the train route provide both directions, not just one direction of travel into Boston, I think in the future, we're looking at that being a two-way uh, uh, availability and benefit to us and our economy of being able to have that technical expertise come uh, work in our area. So that's kind of the, all the ways that we're looking at this workforce development. And of course, the actual training that Pat mentioned, et cetera. But uh, it's a big challenge, but we are looking at all these broad areas to try to help. Improving our roads, of course, will always be an important factor, et cetera, too, um, to get people to and from work easily. But, you know, I myself, just for me, I've, I've lived in, in this region. Um, but for almost 30 years of my career went to either Providence or Boston because that's where the jobs were for my line of civil engineering. So like I say, we're hoping either to improve the transportation there or in some cases, maybe we can get the jobs in the business to move here um, if there's better way for, for them to get here. So that would be my addition to that. Well, thank you. I thank both of my colleagues. So it takes a village, right? Uh, putting everyone's head together to solve the, or to attempt to address and solve the problems that we have before us. And I think uh, circling back to the question of transportation. So uh, as a legislator and you as well as business people, you balance uh, dealing with the here and now, the challenges of the moment, trying to address those and dealing with planning for the future. And so there is not always a good balance. And I had mentioned earlier in the housing conversation that my immediate need is to address the questions that come to me by people who are facing homelessness. Um, other questions, uh, and so we are looking forward to the train being on track soon, uh, 
one of these days. And Gatra is making a yeoman's effort to expand its reach of transportation to bring people uh, around the community, but further outside of the community to meet their needs has been described, uh, just in terms of work has been described by my colleagues. And I, I, I think about the struggle that we have had as a legislative delegation, and perhaps you as well, with uh, transportation that, so before the pandemic, Bloom transported people to Boston. There were stops along the way. You hop on that Bloom bus, you went to your job, you went to your appointment, you did whatever it was along that route. And uh, Bloom gave that up, as you well know, or probably know, uh, and then they don't transport to Boston anymore. So DATCO stepped in and it reaches as far down as New reached as far down as New Bedford. On the weekend, it was at UMass Dartmouth, picking up kids, bringing them home, uh, doing other kinds of things. DATCO gave that up last April, um, uh, much to our displeasure. And so the legislative delegation met with the Department of Transportation to say, what's up with that? We're a transportation desert down here. Help us out. Uh, and Peter Pan uh, hopped on that uh, almost immediately with the help of uh, my colleagues uh, to say, well, we, Peter Pan, took people into the airport and agreed uh, they were willing to stop at South Station so they would pick people up to take them into Boston, drop them at South Station. And so that worked very well for a little while, but they were stopping at the Galleria Mall location and that of course is not available any longer. And so they moved that transportation to East Bridgewater. So somebody from our community, surrounding communities have to go to East Bridgewater in order to pick up a bus to go to Boston. And uh, again, like much else, every time I have an opportunity to raise that question about what are you doing about bringing that transportation route back to our community and further south, uh, uh, southeast as well. And um, recently, someone, uh, a, one of the bureaucrats from the Department of Transportation, approached me and said, oh, you know, I heard what you said at that Ways and Means hearing on transportation we're working on it. And what they are trying to do is to find a location in the community that's large enough to park cars at no cost, where a bus can go into that area and do the turnaround, pick up people, and of course, transport them into Boston. So I raise all of that as number one, it's a problem for, you know, most of us here might hop in our car and go to Boston if we need to do that. Many people in our community, I mean, you know, we're a healthcare uh, desert. We're a maternity desert. We're a pediatric desert. So people need that transportation to get from here to wherever they're going to seek that care. So if you know of anyone who has property in one of these larger spaces where their stores might be closed, that the bus company can use uh, to do the turnaround and pick up people, that would be an extraordinary, extraordinary contribution to the people here in our community. So I, uh, everything takes time, but we keep persisting. And uh, in some way that problem will be solved, that challenge will be solved. And it's not gonna be solved only with the train, but it will be in need, we need that bus transportation. And so think about where in our community we might find a place big enough for that bus to turn around and for cars to park. Um, cars to park as well. So thank you. Thank you for that rep. And if they can't reach the representative, I they were also asking us for that information. So we're uh, happy to pass that on to MassDOT as well uh, to find that space. Uh, we had one question come in. I'm going to throw it out quickly. I know we're getting close on our time and I want to be respectful, uh, but we had a question. Do you agree that the pending state, uh, sorry, Senate bill that would ban third party electric suppliers in the state of Massachusetts, um, and if not a ban, more of an oversight of cap uh, on the rates that they charge. I don't know if anyone wants to. Uh... Could you repeat that, please, Maria? Somebody was asked, do we agree? Do you agree with the pending Senate bill that would ban third party electric suppliers in the state? Um, and if not a ban, more of an oversight or cap on the rates they charge? I'm not familiar with the legislation, so I don't have a lot of other context. So no. I'll, oh, okay. Noam, you go first. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with, with that legislation exactly. Um, mostly 
you know, my district is almost exclusively municipal light plants between Taunton and Middleborough, with a little bit of uh, a few, few several hundred houses only in my district that have ever sourced. And my understanding is that the, the municipal uh, don't typically uh, get involved with the third party um, abilities. But with that being said, I have heard issues with people signing up. The, the intent of the third party uh, availability was to help, uh, you know, keep costs low due to competition. But I have heard, been hearing issues, even though there's not many in my district, but I have heard issues throughout the, the Commonwealth where people have signed up for the third party. And then after a while, the rates go up and rates go up. So I do think it, from what I've been hearing, there does need to be uh, some oversight happening there. But I'm not familiar with the exact issues. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not familiar with the uh, legislation. If the person who has asked the question has a bill number, that would be helpful. Um, and I'd certainly be happy to look at it and talk offline. So I'll just jump in and say that um, I am, you know, very peripherally uh, aware, as um, as Rep. Oral said, it's happening to my constituents because we do have third parties coming in. Um, I agree there should be a cap. <clears throat> I don't want to stop um, any any ability to, you know, get better rates because there's competition. But I do think that because we have a regulated um, utilities state that a cap is fair. Um, you know, you get to the point that you it's it becomes bait and switch. You know, here we're going to do X, Y, Z for you. And they do it for, you know, three months. And then you see your bill go go crazy. So um, I do like the competition and it has been successful. Uh, in my school district, they do um, uh, they do an aggregate where they, they buy uh, gas together. But anyway, uh, yes, a cap is totally necessary, but we still need to encourage there to be competition. All right, well, thank you all very much. I We're approaching the end of our time. I would like to just give each of the panelists a chance to have a few closing remarks and we'll go backwards and start with Rep. Oral this time. Okay, well, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, look forward to the spring, like I say, a big push for the end of the legislative session. So we'll do our best, maybe come back in May and have some more to talk about at the uh, annual meeting or whenever that would be. Um, but. We'll keep you posted and please uh, call us anytime. We're always available. So have a great week. Thank you very much, Rep. Haddad. Um, thank you. And I always appreciate the opportunity to um, speak with people. I want to renew my ask in the middle of the other question. As business leaders, you are very respected. Your opinions matter. And so I would say if you are involved in the suburbs, um, my district or, or anywhere else, uh, we we really need the suburbs to understand that this is this is uh, it's, an, it's an opportunity. Um, it's not it should not be a burden if you do it correctly. If you uh, if you get a developer that you trust, but we really need people not to allow uh, elitist bylaws to keep out people and our own people, our own young people from being able to live in, in a community. So if you are in any of those, please get involved in the process so that we can be sure that um, there are opportunities for affordable housing outside of the cities. Thank you. All right, and finally, Rep. Doherty. Well, thank you very much. Um, I always enjoy these opportunities. And so while we have addressed the very broad issues uh, this morning, steward and housing and uh, other such things, uh, what would be maybe the next time would be uh, important to uh, to us, I believe all of us, I can speak for my colleagues, I guess, um, is to hear from hear from the business people about issues that you are confronting as uh, business people. Uh, there's lots of legislation floating around out there, and uh, occasionally we get messages from people asking about 
this legislation or that legislation or a position on whatever that might be, but to hear from you, to have the questions come from you uh, around those things that affect you deeply uh, in addition to those broad issues would be really very helpful. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. And to the chamber, you're doing a marvelous job. You have a huge membership, which is a credit to you, I have to say. Uh, and I always enjoy these occasions and others on the ground and live when we have an opportunity to do that. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Doherty, Representative Haddad, and Representative Oral, our distinguished Mayor Shauna O'Connell. And thank you, Mary Ellen, for being a, a great uh, host for us today. We really appreciate that. Thank you all for taking the time on this Monday morning to join us. Uh, I will do one plug. Obviously, we have a lot of events going on all the time. But for this group in particular, our next quarterly Q&A will be with the president of the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation. And he will talk about state finances, house amendments, and demographic, demographic trends for the state and our area, which I think will be very interesting as well. So please join us for that. That's April 23rd. If you're able to join, go on the website and register. And um, thank you all for being here this morning. Have a great rest of your day and week. Thank you.